welcome to our church. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out. I've already seen visitors. Buckle today. up and hold up. We're going to do it again. I've already seen some visitors out here today, so make sure you get a chance to get around and meet the new folks. There are some folks that have moved back in the area uh, that are back here as well, so definitely get around. Uh, my challenge for you is to find a new face first before you talk to anybody else at the fellowship time, okay? That's the challenge. I'm Pastor Andy. You're at What's New Worship. Uh, we do things a little differently, and we do things a little differently every week, and um, God, God's just moving here. We're watching people get saved. Next week, we'll have some people getting baptized. If you want to be baptized, it's very important that you, you speak to me, and we, uh, well, <laughs> It's important you speak to God, but it's very important you speak to me so that we make sure that uh, you know what, what it's about. Uh, what I like to say about it is that um, uh, salvation is God's commitment to us. Baptism is our commitment back to God. And um, He saves you. He loves you. But at the same time, there's something awesome about publicly proclaiming who He is. So if you want to be baptized, we want to do that next week at a pool party uh, over at the Lefevre's house. So let me know on that. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship today. And uh, a big challenge for you. Offer God what he deserves, not what you feel like. Ooh, wow. That'll beat you up, won't it? Let's pray, and uh, let's be led into the throne room and let God change us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we want to start with just how awesome you are. God, I I've watched you work many times already this week. Lord, you've put things into place and done some really, really phenomenal things, God. And that's because you're God. You were you're just awesome. Thank you for working in my life. Thank you for uh, saving me. Lord, I pray right now for the worship that we're about to enter into, God, as we come back and tell you just um, what we think of you and how we adore you and how we praise you. Lord, uh, anoint the, uh, the, the people that are worshiping for us, Lord, and leading us. Lord, we pray for the fellowship time that we'll get around and meet some folks and make them feel welcome and, and share stories on uh, hope and, and pray for folks, Lord. And then for the testimonies that will be told, God, of your word and how it's changed people's lives, Lord, I pray for transforming power to show up here today. God, we are, we are inviting you to do that. God, would you please show up and change us? Lord, we want to be who you desi desire us to be. God, you are an awesome, awesome God, and we thank you for what you're going to do here today. In your precious name we pray, so be it. Now you're going to get a little bit of home cooking today, uh, and I say a little bit because two of the, the band uh, attend here regularly, and we're uh, happy to have Michael and Adele uh, come with Freeing the Prisoners. Hey, um, th this is what I believe. Man, wasn't that awesome? Adele, that is beautiful. That is absolutely awesome, and thank you guys for that. Um, Thanks for leading us into worship. We're, we're going to do things differently today. I 100% I believe that uh, if you have hope, you uh, share it with people. And so we're going to have some testimonies today. And our first testimony is uh, somebody that I met a, a few years back and um, absolutely have fell in love with the passion that she has uh, for people. And... Um, I started thinking then, like, man, this, this lady has it together, and she's trying to do some really awesome things in the community. I, I can't wait till one day uh, to work together with her, and I thought maybe we would just be doing some community projects, working together that way, and God has put it in her path and in our path to have her come on and join us as our youth director, and I believe this 100%. Her leadership and her passion for our young people, your teenagers, is going to cause a revolution in this uh, area. I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm putting a lot of pressure on you, Missy. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've talked to her many times and just listened to her heart, and I'm um, very excited for her to be introduced to you guys and, and just watch God move uh, in, in this way in an awesome, awesome way. So if you'll give a warm welcome to your new youth director, <laughs> Missy Tyler. I felt the same way working in another ministry. And what's new is all over the place. So I was always kind of doing my thing and looking over like, what are they doing over there? And one of my buddies this week um, 
who have also been friends with Andy for a very long time, and, and they kind of started up this Ignite Youth Leaders, Area Youth Leaders group. He was joking around with me the other day, and he goes, look, you're definitely from what's new. If you've posted on Facebook 425 times a day, <laughs> if your block party has everything under the sun for the community and is free, and he starts naming things on and on. And I'm so blessed and humbled, and it's so awesome to finally be here um, at what's new. It got a little weird with transition. You can't really be in two places at once, so I'm excited to be here. And um, I've typed in these words to these worship songs, and tears were just coming down my face because I sing those songs because I believe them. And I know that the little cubby place I was around, they believed it too. And I just felt the spirit so strong. And um, I could just quote the lyrics that we worship with today and be done. And especially the last one, to be overcome with the presence of the Lord, because I've been overcome with a lot of stuff. You feel me? So to be overcome with his presence, there's nothing like it. These lyrics right here can sum it up for my life. Lord, show me how to love as you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And everything I am is for your kingdom cause. That's my life. I can sit down right now. But just like Andy said, the testimony, I believe everybody has one. No one can tell it quite like you. No one has yours. No one has mine. And I believe testimonies bring healing. Um, I didn't believe that for the longest time. I was ashamed. I was so embarrassed of where I came from. I didn't want people to know what my family was like. I didn't want them to know the house I grew up in or the neighborhood. I didn't want them to know the brokenness of my family, the mental illness in my family, the addictions, the abuse. I didn't want people definitely to know the choices I had made, the filth that I had walked through the things I had seen, the things that were done to me, the things that I did to other people. I was embarrassed. I carried around so much shame and so much guilt. And when I first got saved, I was barely 28. And um, when I first got saved, I was being called to, I need to share these things, I need to share these things. But the people I was around, they really didn't have the same stories as I did. So again, I felt shamed, like I had to keep it inside, like, okay, God's working for them, but he's really not for someone like me, for someone that came from the places I came from. And when I first got saved, I dove headfirst into everything. And what started freeing me is his word. And one of the first scriptures I, I heard, and we hear it all the time, there's songs about it, it's plastered all over the place, it's Psalm 119, it's your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's so familiar. We know that he's going to give us the light and show us what steps to take, and, and he's going to show us the path and which direction to go. But as I meditated on that scripture, I was like, but God, I don't think that you want me to go with you. I don't think that you want someone like me to take those steps. And clear as day, I need you all to hear this. I don't know if you've ever quite heard it like this, but God said this to me. He gave me this. He said, my light for you, my child, is not just for the steps you're going to take. It's for the steps you've taken. So when I started diving into his word and I started looking at the scripture and I started seeing my life through his eyes, through his word, that's when I started a grasp understanding of all the stuff I've been through, of all the stuff I walked through, all the decisions I made, all the filth I started seeing. Man, he has a purpose. He's going to use it all. And he says that in his word. So I'm telling you, if you don't hear anything else today, it's stay in his word because that light, his word, is not just for our steps with him. It was for our steps without him. And I believe that and I see it. So I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in a church. I didn't always believe in God, but I can look back now and see him in the places that I fought. I fought against him. And for every reason someone gave me as to why he existed, I could shoot back real quick as to why he didn't. If there was a God, why did I have to see this? If there was a God, why did this happen to me? The beauty of that is his word is healing. His word is the light, just like we prayed about for offering. It's the light. And I believe when we start looking at our life, 
through the way God sees it, we'll start to get that understanding in his truth. So my family had a lot of brokenness, and um, from an early age, I'm talking five, I was doing things that other kids weren't doing because I didn't have the family dynamics, I didn't have the structure in the home, and I just had freedoms that other kids didn't. I was running around the streets, I grew up in poverty, I grew up in uh, apartments and, um, uh, you know, community uh, assisted apartments, and um, so I was running the streets with older kids, and with that, stuff happens. When you're not being watched, when there's no boundaries, when you're given the freedom to do whatever you want to do, stuff happens. Stuff happened to me from an early age. I was being taken advantage of. I was molested as a young child. I made decisions based off things that happened to me because I didn't have any self-worth. I didn't look at myself as worth anything. Physically, mentally, gifts me what do I have to offer my family I felt like it, I came from nothing that's what I felt nothing and so I lived that life I made decisions that represented me with a lack of self-worth and I went through life with no boundaries as a teenager which it ended me up um, I think officially I was 11 in the justice system and I got arrested for shoplifting I had been brought home by the police many times before that but it was official at that age to get into the system and from there it just kept getting worse and worse I started getting into drugs it's getting high all the time I hated everyone and I felt like everyone was the same that everyone was selfish and had ulterior motives and I was filled with so much hate um, I felt like if you were to give me any attention, it was just because you wanted something for yourself. So I bottled that, and I put out an image that I hated everyone, and I did, trust me. I had no passion for people. I had no compassion. I didn't care. Um, I was about myself, and I was about taking care of myself, and I wasn't doing a good job of it. I actually chose the streets than my home life. I left home for the last time at 15. Um, when I was caught up in the drugs, like I said, I started getting high, hanging around the wrong people, fell for this older guy, and it just got worse. Um, I started doing pills, and that had me, along with the guy and along with the pills. Once you start taking them, then you find out different ways you can take them and use them and get high, and it's greater and bigger, and you're just trapped. And when I was 15, I chose the street life because I felt like if I'm taking care of myself, and if I'm the only one looking out for me, then I'm going to be out there. I don't need to be at home. Well, here I was, 15, underage. That can't happen. It does, and it did, but the courts intervened. And I bounced from house to house to house to house. I eventually ended up um, up here and living with my dad, but I still came with me. So it was just a matter of weeks before I was into the same old stuff, shoplifting, guys, no self-worth still, drugs, I, like that, I found it. And um, my dad and his family um, didn't know what to do with me, just like everyone else before. And they kind of just sent me to a doctor because they didn't know what I was doing. I was just a ball of anger, doing whatever I wanted. Um, living in filth, making filthy decisions, and they saw that on drugs, and they saw that. They just didn't know what. So they took me to the doctor. I thought I was just going for a regular checkup, and they had a drug screening, and they found, you know, whatever they found. So here comes treatment centers. And um, so from the time I was 15, I started going in and out treatment centers, in and out of facilities, in and out. And that was pretty much my childhood. Um, still didn't know God, still didn't know Jesus. There was really no one in my life that would lead me to him or that told me about the Bible or told me about this message and, or let me know of this hope. But I do know God used all that, and he used this one facility I was at for over two years to stop me dead in my tracks, and he stopped me. But this is when the shame continued and I was embarrassed and I felt like, okay, I'm getting my stuff together. I'm not doing the drugs anymore. I met another guy, and we had a lot of stuff in common. Unfortunately, one of the things we had in common were drugs. Another thing we had in common was to stay off of drugs. And um, it kind of worked. 
we ended up getting married. I had two kids, and uh, he was a heroin addict. And um, I believe 100% drug addiction, the only healer to dig that deep into someone's life is Jesus. The only thing to take something like that away is the love of Jesus, the truth in his word. I believe that. And before he passed away, he was saved. So that was part of a shame of my past that I didn't want people to know about. And I tried to hide behind, I got a job, I tried to hide behind looking good and, and getting my stuff together, getting my finances together. I met someone else. We had this neat little family, took family pictures, sent out Christmas cards, and I tried to look the part, but I was carrying around this emptiness and the same filth as before, and it was surfacing. And there were some things that I was still making decisions it was a godless life I was living. The decisions I was making represented that, and it was hitting me. I was broken, and I was hurting. All this stuff from my past was servicing. All of these new things as an adult that I was making decisions about was crushing me even more. And it was this longing in my heart. It was something in my heart that was leading me. And it was like, I'm just going to go to church. Of all the places I could have been led, all the places I had chosen before, I ended up going to church. And it was because I had made a string of decisions as an adult woman that I was so, I felt so filthy about. I was tore up. I, I had enough. And I knew with this calling on my heart that there was something out there. There was something bigger than the life that I was living. There was something greater. There had to be a purpose. What in the world is that purpose? So I ended up going to church, and I can't tell you what the pastor said that first sermon, but all I can tell you is every single word hit my heart. Every single word. That was January 2006, and I can probably count on one hand how many times I've missed church since then. Not because I'm keeping a perfect attendance award, because every time I sit in here, Every time we worship, every time the message is being read, it pierces my heart. It's like made anew every single time. Tears start coming. I fall in love with Jesus over and over and over again. So when I got saved, there was that shame again. I can't let people know where I came from because your God will love you, but he won't love me. Your God, yeah, he's forgiven you for your sins, but let me tell you, you don't know where I've come from. And again, I dove in his word, and I started hearing stuff in his word. Romans 3, if anyone's struggling with God can't forgive me, I've done some bad stuff, you don't know where I've come from, Romans 3. Just read it over and over and over and over and over again. Read it in multiple translations. It hit me. It was like, man, it doesn't matter. We've all sinned. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter. One of my verses that I live by is 1 Corinthians 6. If you haven't read it, read it. Paul's talking about, and again, I came to God with all this shame, and I came to my church people. I thank God that I had spiritual leaders to guide me and to be in the word with me and to be in prayer. Because one thing I, I came across in 1 Corinthians 6 was Paul starts naming off all these things that people did and all these things that people were, all these sexual sins and all things that people did with their bodies. And I just identify with all of it. And it hit me because he goes, look, no matter what you once were, you have been washed clean. No matter what, that started breaking away these chains of shame, breaking away these chains of guilt. Every single time I read something new in the Bible or maybe something again, something new pierced my heart. No matter what you once were, you've been washed clean. You've been made right with God because of what Jesus did. And now you have his Holy Spirit living inside. And then when I first got saved, what I thought that God couldn't use, what I thought that God couldn't forgive, he did. And he was healing me with his word. And he was healing me with the spirit. And the next thing I know, one of the first Bible studies we went to, um, like a month when we were going in the church, it started off, we were like at a table by ourselves because we didn't really know anybody. You remember this? And by the end of the Bible study, I kid you not, week after week, our table kept getting bigger 
and bigger until like the end of the study it was like everyone was on our side of the room because I, man, I was so hungry for his word and I had all these questions and everything I read I believed I was like what get out and it pierced my heart and people loved it because they believed it too and the testimony that was coming out of my mouth just through a simple bible study was healing them there was breakthrough praise God hmm and so the next thing I know, when I see all these people leading and, and, and doing ministry stuff, and I, I couldn't even get up in front of people and read the Bible, much less talk to somebody, talk to a bunch of people, pray in public. Are you kidding me? God started changing my heart. And all these things that I was trying to hide that I thought he I, had questioned, like, man, why did I have to see that? He started bringing it to the surface, started healing, started breaking the chains. The next thing you know, here's another verse that Paul wrote, actually. It says that whatever comfort that I've given you, whatever comfort I've given you, you can use that same comfort for someone else going through the same thing. And so there I am again. Wow, this happened? God's going to use it. Romans, I'm going to use all things. I'm going to work all things together. And guess what? He started to work all these things that I questioned about, all these things that I was like, man, why did that happen? All these things, he started putting purpose to it, purpose to my pain. He started bringing the purpose to other people's pain. We were all having breakthrough. We were all being free. We were all getting healed. I believe my ministries come from my darkest pain. All the places I tried to leave and tried to avoid and tried to hide and cover up are the places that I'm literally killing myself to get in. Juvenile prisons. <laughs> really? Who wants to go into a prison? Satan's territory. I have stories from going into the Culpeper Juvenile Correctional Center, 18 to 21 year old males. I kid you not. Satan's territory deep in those halls. I have awesome stories of Jesus being right there. He was there before we came, but right there. Stories of just awesome breakthrough, stories of salvation, stories of healing, youth. When I first started getting the desire to serve the Lord and to give back and to love on people, he put a heart for young people. I was like, ugh, no. Uh, and I remember, you know, my pastor at the time was like, is God calling you? And I was like, oh, youth. And thank God he said, well, we kind of have a youth leader already. We already have people. And I was like, Phew, good. I guess God doesn't want me in youth. I'll just pick up a guitar. Um, but once my heart became his, I fell in love with the youth. And I was like, well, Lord, these youth, what do I have to offer them? So I started praying. And I said, Lord, bring the youth that you know that I can touch. Bring the youth that you can use me to affect their lives. Bring me those that were like me. And so he did. He started bringing them. And um, another cool story I have is I'll never forget before we left my first church, they had this like children's worship leader spot open. And, and I was so excited. Like, oh, I really don't want to work with youth, but kids are cool. And I have kids. And so I was like, I totally can see myself. I went to the lady. I was like, I totally can see myself like singing songs with the kids and playing on my guitar and all these old campfire songs that you church people sing. That'd be so awesome. She was like, oh my gosh, that'd be great. Do you play the guitar? I was like, no, but I have one. <laughs> and seriously, God put that on my heart and he burned that in my soul. He burned youth. He burned troubled youth. He burned people that are on the streets. He burned all that. Some that are locked up in the institutions, locked up in the jails. He, he burned it all on my heart because that's where I came from. All that worship stuff, man, that, whoo, when we get in here, sometimes I don't think we know who we're worshiping. Sometimes I think, like, man, if we don't fall flat on our face because the giver of life is entering this space, man. 
So he burned all that on my heart. He did make me a worship leader long before I can pick up my guitar, long before I started to truly sing for him and started to connect with the worship music itself. He made me that worship leader and gave me that worshipful heart. And he's doing that with all of us. And he put that heart of youth burning so big. I love youth. I love the youth here, and I don't even know all of them. I love the youth in our community, and I don't even, I love them so much. It's like that ugly, contagious, get on your nerves type of love, you know what I mean? I will embarrass you in public, and I always tell them, you better say hi to me in public, or I will embarrass you. <laughs> but all of them, they mostly, they all come say hi. That's cool. So, um, love you guys. My buddies just walked in. Um, so what I thought God couldn't use in my life, he used. And he's using it for breakthrough. And like I said, I believe my ministries come from my deepest, darkest pain. I've been in ministry full-time since 2009. And that is a testimony in itself. I worked full-time. Like I said, I had a good job. I had a family that looked good on the Christmas card. And I really tried to clean things up to make it look good. And um, I come from a civil engineering background for work. And I left all of it. All of it all of it. And people looked at me and said, are you nuts? Are you crazy? You have a family. You got bills. Insurance? You don't have insurance? I left it because the life of serving God, he has taken care of me in better ways than a compensation package ever did, in better ways than health insurance ever did. That was back then before Obamacare, so now I know it's not taken care of anybody. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I hate politics. Let me tell you, there's nothing more that makes me feel further from God than that, and I don't ever dip into it. I, I, God's word, that's what I'll spill out. If you're friends with me on Facebook and haven't unfriended me yet, that's all you'll see. My Facebook's the ministry page. Um, so I believe that we have to bring the light literally to our life. Remember, that light that comes down is not just where we're going, but that light on our feet on our feet is where we've been, and I believe that we need to bring those things to the light. We need to talk about them. If there is shame, if there is guilt, if there are burdens on your heart that you've carried with you, talk with your spiritual leaders about them. Let them guide you in scriptures, guide you in prayer, guide you with the Holy Spirit and worship and healing, I promise you, will begin. The third one, the take home is God wants to use you, and he wants to use all of you. All that you've been through, he turns mess into ministry. Bring it. Bring it to him. Whatever you bring to him, whatever you give to him, he'll use it, and he'll multiply the blessings from it. And what is a sacrifice to you, he's going to blow it up into something greater. Whatever you release, he's going to bring it back to you in ways that you will never imagine. And I get to live that every day. And not, things aren't perfect by any means. I can go spit down the list of um, life that's happened since I got saved. I mean, our house has been on the auction block, what, three times since going into full-time ministry? What? But guess what? I haven't lost it. God's provided. We were able to shed things in our life, in my life, that weren't needed. God blessed me beyond ways that I can ever imagine. And those people that I didn't want anything to do with about, those youth, those teenagers that I just keep them in your house, he has blessed me in unimaginable ways. These youth that I've had in my life for the past six years have changed my life more ways than I can count that they've told me how I've changed theirs. That's God. So if God can take someone like me, a filthy, chaotic, who turns the chaos back into order we just sang, if he can take all that chaos from the life I came from, from the childhood that I grew up in, from the purposeless, hopeless, godless life, throw me into his word and pour in hope and his truth in my life, and not only that, but use me, put me with your kids, okay? If he can do that for me, he can do that for anybody. And he wants to do it. 
I was hoping God would kind of put this in an order that makes sense, and I trust that he did that, and I trust that he's going to close it out just right. I started with this, so I'll finish. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. You're going to show me your way. You're going to light that path. You're going to allow me to see my life through your eyes and through your words. But that light and that truth is not just for where I'm going. It's for where I've been. I pray that God spoke to you through his word, through the little testimony that I offered. And I hope that the healing will begin for you, that the light will be able to be shed for you, this brief testimony. Jesus name. Amen. I I told you guys we're in for something awesome. Uh, God's going to use her and God's putting some awesome pieces together. But uh, the, I've got one more testimony before we leave and that's from the drummer and uh, we we met over here we just were introducing ourselves the last time we were we were here. It was kind of hey, hello, my name's Baron, my name's Andy and then an hour and a half later or something like that, we were still talking and I'm doing that right now. So, uh, Baron, if you'll come ahead and just share what God's put on your heart and um, we're going to let God do his thing. So, uh, man, I can, I can feel the, uh, the presence of God in this place. I can feel the Holy Spirit coming and just, uh, just, just basking in his glory right now. Um, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for um, having me. Andy, thanks a lot, man. Um, I'm going to open up in prayer really quick because I think uh, prayer is probably one of the most important things we can do, um, praying and reading the Bible. So just bow your heads with me. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, as, uh, Lord, as I just lift you just higher than, than, higher than anything I could ever offer. But Lord, I just I lift your name on high. Uh, I want to praise you for the rest of my life, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this church. I thank you for what you've done in this community. Um, we just feel your presence here tonight, Lord. We just thank you for everything that you've done. Um, Lord, I, I want to thank you for the for the victory that the Redskins had, we are undefeated, and everybody said, "Amen." So, <laughs> so uh, man, um, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, not to lie, I'm feeling pretty nervous right now, but it's all right. Um, so, man, my testimony, my testimony. All right, so. I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my mom's sitting right there. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, but I mean, I always heard this word saved. What is saved? I mean, uh, it wasn't until later I learned that actually being saved is actually not being uh, eternally separated from God. It means not to go into eternal damnation. It means that you, you don't have to be in hell and looking up and seeing what you've actually turned your back on for eternity. That's being saved. That is something that that blew my mind the first time I heard that. That's something that's just uh, I've looked at. Um, I, I'm, I'm a youth leader too. Um, I, I, I preach that to my kids. I preach that to my kids. I, I, I preach that, man. Next time you're in school, you look at that person next to you. Look at that person next to you. That person might not be spending eternity. You got you got you gotta you gotta share your story. You gotta share the message with that person. So. The one thing that I've learned from my testimony, I'm going to take a swig of this. Hang on. The one thing I've learned about my testimony is that my testimony is not over. Uh, none of our testimonies are over. We are not at the end of our lives. We're in the middle of the battle. 
The battle might not be won. The war is won, but the battle is still ongoing. Um, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home, but the consistency that my parents had towards the love of Jesus Christ is what saved me in my, in, in, in my walk with Christ and everything. Um, so, uh, man, I started partying at the age of 15. Um, you know, just uh, I grew up in church. My uncle was a pastor, but I, I, I started, like, just really, you know, I was in a, a metal band. Um, wasn't a Christian metal band, but, you know, um, and so, uh, and we would just, we, we had this shack, and we used to party all the time on weekdays. We used to sleep on the weekend because that was our time that we didn't have to do anything. We could just sleep all day long. We, I used to show up school, you know, drunk sometimes from the night before and stuff. And just, you know, but uh, my parents kept, kept talking to me and stuff. I, I just kept casting them out like, man, I don't care what you guys have to say. I want, I want to live what I, I want to do what I want to do. So I started going to festivals, started going into like the hippie scene, started doing like the hallucinogenic drugs and everything, started, started getting like real deep into a society that I didn't really like, I didn't really understand it and I didn't really get it, but it was just something that was like, man, this seems cool right now. This seems cool. But now I look back at, man, I was trading the ultimate or I was trading, yeah, I was trading the ultimate for the immediate. In my life, I was trading the ultimate for the immediate. Immediate satisfaction. Um, I started selling drugs. Um, I started getting stuff that no one else would get. So everybody would want me to go to their party. I'd be the party guy. You know, I'd, I'd show up, you know, here, you know, here's y'all, you know, get, taking money, selling drugs and stuff like that. It was just something that, like, living that fast lifestyle. I was never addicted to a certain drug, but I was addicted to that lifestyle. That lifestyle, man, is something that you can get so wrapped up in and so blinded that you literally just, that's all you care about. The faster it moves, like, the more happy you get and everything. But, like, but being, being happy and being joyful is two different things. Being happy, being in the present and immediate, like, that's not, that's not ultimate joy. That's not immediate, or that's not, like, eternal joy and everything. So, um, I got busted. Um, I got busted with, uh, man, it was like a dime bag of, it was a dime bag of Coke and like a bag of weed or something like that and ended up uh, going on first offenders. First offenders mean you do a, a year of probation, then you get off. And, uh, man, I was like, man, I pulled one over on the courts, man, I'm out of here, doing the same thing again. Um, then, uh, I was living with my wife. We were not married at the time. I was actually in the church. I was actually drumming for my church and partying on the weekends, living a double life, living, living two lifestyles. Um, being in the church on the week, doing whatever I wanted on the weekend. I used to show up for worship team practice high from smoking 10 minutes before I rolled inside the parking lot. I, I showed up at church tripping on acid before. Why? I don't know. Just did it. It's just what came natural to me. I was living with my wife, as I said, and uh, we didn't even hear a knock on the door. Just boom! Drug task force raided my house. Man, I was, I was so wrapped up in that lifestyle, none of these guys were wearing badges. So I reached, I reached behind my couch and pulled out a baseball bat. I was getting ready to Swing at him, saw the last guy through the door out of badger on him. You know, I was getting busted. I was getting ready to, you know, I don't even know what I was going to do. I was probably going to get beat up, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, man, right then and there, I was like, man, all right, I need something to change. I need something to change. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. But, I, I mean, I started getting a little bit more involved in church and started kind of getting away from the, the selling of the drugs, but I was still using still drinking. Man, but I'll tell you one thing. Me and my wife were at Wood Grill in Harrisonburg one night. My dad called me. He said, you need to come home right now. I said, okay, what happened? He goes, you just need to come home. I said, okay. Just sat down, had less than the first plate of food at a buffet. I love buffets, but you know. <laughs> but so I was like, all right, you know, so I'm I start driving home, and I start getting phone calls. Man, you hear what happened? You hear what happened? I said, no, like, are you driving? Like, you might not want to drive. I was like, man, I'm cool, man. Let me just get home, all right? 
It's like, oh, I fill up gas, I need gas, and keep getting phone calls and everything. I show up to my house. There's people from the church there. There's people from the community. Um, I didn't see my mom at first. I thought, thought something might have happened to her. But uh, sorry if I get choked up on this. This is kind of heavy. But uh, my dad pulled me aside and said, um, your brother, your brother just died of a drug overdose. Um, my brother, to me, at the time, was a hero. Um, I believe he got saved at one point, but I don't, I didn't see much fruit of that. To tell you the truth, I don't know if he's in heaven or not. I don't know. I believe he did get saved. Um, I don't believe that uh, our God is an Indian giver. So, but um, I know one thing's for sure. He was my hero because he's the one who had the more, more drugs than I did. He's, he was a more popular guy. He acted on all that stuff. He, he, he's the one who kind of got me into that lifestyle a little bit. But uh, it was my choice to get into the lifestyle. He didn't pull me into anything. He just showed me how to do it. So I remember that night, I just I didn't want to be around anybody. I, I ran to my brother's room. He wasn't living at home. He was living in uh, South Carolina, but his room was still there in case he came home. I was laying in his bed, and I just started crying. And uh, I didn't want to be near anybody. I didn't want to. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want. I didn't want comfort. I just wanted to sit there, and I just wanted to just to let some stuff out. But I went finally went downstairs, and people from the church are comforting me and praying for me. And one lady said, "You know, I had a twin brother who died and everything." So I started listening to her, and um, you know, it just uh, kind of got a little bit more uh, involved in the drugs after that. I thought it was, you know, I, I swore to myself, "Man, I'm done. I'm done." You know, told people on the phone. Don't call me, don't text me, don't just, I don't want anything to do with you. But after a while, I started getting back into that because that's the only way I knew how to heal something. Remember I said, trading the ultimate for the immediate, immediate satisfaction. Started getting more involved in drugs. Um, throughout this entire time, I have, I have a court date that I have to keep showing up to. I have, I have stuff that I keep having to go to because I've already gotten busted. But, uh, man, I'll tell you what. I was so focused on partying before I went to jail. My, my lawyer told me, he goes, look, we're going to try to get this down, but uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, you're probably going to be uh, facing up to 15 years. Um, my parents prayed for that. Um, Telling my mom, I wanted to hide that from my mom for a long time. Telling my mom that uh, was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. I didn't want to break her heart. Um, but uh, luckily, the lawyer came up to me. He said, look, I got a thing that uh, I think you might be interested in. It's called detention and diversion. You go to jail for a little bit, however long the judge sets it up for. Then you go to detention camp, which is a military drilled boot camp without the guns, pretty much. Um, then you go into a prison halfway house, which is diversion. You get work release, but you still stay in a prison. Not these, not these big prisons and everything. It was more like a road camp. But um, so uh, I agreed to that, and I had 15 years hanging over my head. If I failed one of these programs, there was no doubt in my mind that I would be going away for no less than five. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in jail, my first night in jail. Man, I start, I just got down. I'm, I'm on this cot. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like it's like this big. They got a built-in pillow. You got to use your arm for a pillow. The most uncomfortable thing in the world. But uh, I'm laying on that thing, and I said, man, I said, God, what, what have I gotten myself into? Like, what, what is this? I said, you know what? I said, I've lived my life the way that I wanted to live it. From this point, from, from the point where I started partying up till now, I said, let's see what you have in store for me. I tell you what, I've never second guessed it. I've never looked back. Amen. And I've never, ever thought that Jesus Christ wasn't my Savior. Amen. I'll tell you one thing. That was the first time in my life where 
I got a Bible sent to me from my pastor. This is not it. My wife bought me this one, but I got a Bible sent to me from my pastor, and later on my mom sent me a Bible. It's the first time I actually picked up a Bible and started reading it to actually get something out of it. Who here has read the Bible just to read it? Be honest. Who's just read it to read it? You think you're doing good? You think, yeah, man, I'm, I'm reading the Bible and everything. You're not actually, you're not, you're not feeding yourself. It's just another book at that point. You've got to actually focus on it and say, okay, this is what's going to save me. The living word of God. I have written in the front of my Bible, this is the living word of God. He lives within this book. Man, I'll tell you what. As I was in jail, I started, uh, started reading the Bible, started get, getting together with other inmates and stuff like that. Um, started actually like, you know, getting stuff out of it. And I walk out to people, man, look, look, look at the verse I read. Look at the verse I read. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I started praying over stuff and everything, and eventually I got moved out um, to a boot camp. Remember I said if I fail one of these programs, go back to, I'll go to prison. I remember I was in boot camp. It was like my first week there. Some guy punched me in the face. Got in a fight. Man, it took every ounce of courage not to do something back to that man. But the one thing that saved me from that was what I read in the Bible. It, it, it changed my mindset. Remember I was saying people were busting through my door. I was going to grab a baseball bat. It took every ounce of energy not to hit that man back, knowing that if I get in one fight, you get in a single scuffle, one thing, you're out. No questions asked. You're out. They sent both of you out. Doesn't matter if you, he threw the punch. Doesn't matter. You're both out. So I started going to church uh, meetings in there. Started going to celebrate recovery. Um, man, just getting more involved in the words, hearing speakers talk about stuff I've never heard before. My uncle's a pastor, and I started listening to people that stuff I've never heard before. Man, I'm telling you what, though. When I went to the work release camp, um, they set you up with a job. That job I still have today. Um, but the, the day before I started that job, uh, my brother and my sister came to visit me. Um, this was right after Father's Day. And they, they, they were they're meeting in the back room and everything, and usually you don't do that. It's right out in front so everybody can see you. And I sat down and I said, hey, what's up? They said, uh, dad just died. Uh, my dad died of cirrhosis of the liver. He, uh, when he was my age, he battled with drugs. Um, and it caught up to him 30, 40 years down the road. So uh, I'll tell you guys what. If you guys want to get in drug, involved in drugs right now, you don't know what that's going to do for your life 30 years from now. Um, when my father passed away, um, they told me that I can either get the job and go to work knowing that my father just passed away, or I can go work at like a Burger King, making, you know, getting treated like crap and everything. And um, I mean, I didn't get treated that much better, but they wouldn't let me take a leave of absence because I hadn't started yet. So I had to go to work every single day knowing my father just passed away, knowing that the last time I saw my father was Father's Day, knowing that the last time I saw my father, my father saw me incarcerated, in jail, but he knew that I was a new person and I was saved. Uh, that's, a, that's a big struggle I have, knowing that the last time my father saw me, I was in jail. But uh, I know that he would be proud of me. I know that for a fact because he told me all the time. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a struggle and everything, but uh, it's something that I got through just with the love of Jesus Christ. Getting out and getting married, man, the, I got married the day after I got out of jail. My wife, um, she is probably one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my entire life. She was faithful to me the entire time I was in jail. Um, she set up a whole wedding while I was in jail by herself and her mom. I got married the day after I got out of jail. Um, Man, it was me, my wife, and the preacher. My preacher, the preacher was was my best friend at the time. Like, like I said, I was involved in church and everything. I got a real close relationship with him, but I was lying to him the entire time, just doing drugs, doing whatever I wanted. But uh, I'll tell you what, he married us. 
And I started replacing those bad habits with the good habits. See, here's the thing. You want to get out of addiction. You want to get out of rough spots in your life. Don't just sit at home and do nothing. That ain't going to help. You got to replace those bad habits with good habits. You got to replace that mindset with a different mindset. The Bible says that he creates all things new. You got to get new stuff in your life. You got to get start getting start get, investing in other things that than what you were wrapped up in before. Like I said, I'm a I'm a youth leader. I do the worship team at my church. There's nothing greater than finding your place with God. There's nothing greater when you're doing the gifts that He gave you. There is nothing greater. I, I, I've been I've been talking to youth group kids and everything. I've been driving home, not even know how I get home. I just literally just like fall down and be like, man, that was, that was so right. That was so awesome. Because I'm using the gifts that he gave me. Um, God's faithfulness and consistency in my life cannot be overlooked. Without a shadow of a doubt, I could not be where I am right now without him. But like I said, the battle's not over. I still have to trust in him. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean I can just do whatever I want. So uh, your testimony is not over. Um, it still lives today than the day that you got out of addiction, drugs, and the day you got saved. But the one thing is, um, the one thing about that is, is that you cannot second guess you being saved. If you're second guessing yourself, man, am I saved? I don't know if I'm saved. My mom told me a story where a farmer kept doing that, kept second guessing, am I saved, am I saved, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saved or not. So he went around his barn and drove a stake in the ground. And every single time he passed that stake, he said, I'm saved. And I'm second guessing it now. I'm saved for eternity. I do not have to worry about being eternally separated from God. So I want to share um, some scripture with you. Um, something that I've looked at and I've just it just it completely blew my mind completely changed my mindset um, if you have a Bible you can turn to it if you don't I don't care I mean I do care I shouldn't have said that but, um, if you want to read along I guess it's going to be uh, Mark 4 35 this is Jesus calm the storm I'm going to read this to you and then I'm going to break it down um, that day when evening came he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was on the stern, stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked, rebuked the winds, and said, Waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I'm going to break this down a little bit for you guys because this is such a key story seven verses in the book of Matthew it's five verses in the book of uh, Luke it's four same story but Mark is kind of based on Peter's interpretation so Peter was kind of a talker and I like that about Peter because he tells a little bit other details that the rest of them don't I want to talk about the storms of your life and the fight for your life no storm is insignificant in your life. No storm is insignificant. If it matters to you, it matters to God. The smallest thing, it matters to him. Our holy momentum is actually being challenged by a storm. What is on the other side is so valuable and so important and significant that all of hell will stand at attention if you get there. And if you if you get to the other side, that they know that they will be in trouble. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. 
Storms happen even when Jesus is in your boat. I've gone through storms even when after I was saved. Just because Jesus is in your boat doesn't mean everything's going to be all good now. Like I said, your testimony is not over. That's one thing that you have, to, you have to keep reminding yourself. Just because you're saved doesn't mean it's all good. It's all great. It's all grand. It's not the way it is. A lot of lies come up in churches. And, um, they say, like, you know, maybe if you increased your prayer time. You know, you're doing 15 minutes. What if you did 45? Maybe if, uh, maybe if you read your Bible for 60 minutes instead of 30, these storms wouldn't happen in your life. That's a lie. Storms happen all the time to everybody every day. Even if you read your Bible day and night, it doesn't matter. Storms are going to come up. But the most important thing is that we, we can't wear our storms as a badge of merit. We can't say, well, I'm spiritual because I went through this storm. I'm more spiritual than this person because, because I went through this. We can't, we can't do that. A lot of people say, I'm, I'm spiritual because I'm a target of the enemy. Angels and demons are more similar than what you think because an angel's job is to pull you towards Christ. The demon's job is to drive you away. If you invest your life in Christ, you are going to have those times when demons try to pull you away. Let's be honest for a second. Maybe, maybe we can't blame it on demons all the time. Maybe we're in storms because we don't balance our checkbook enough. You can't blame everything on the devil. You can't blame everything on demons. Sometimes We've got to work for ourselves sometimes. And I've, I've been learning that. Life happens even when Jesus is in your boat. All of life is just still continues to go on. But the battle is not won yet. Sometimes you're not sunk. But let's be honest. You know you're going to make it to the other side because Jesus is going to do what he said he was going to do. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And if you're going through a testimony trial period right now, just remember Jesus is going to take you to the other side of that because he's going to do what he says he's going to do. He is faithful and he's consistent. He showed me that in my life. Sometimes you've got to worship wet. It says that the boat was in the middle of a storm. These are fishermen. These guys live on boats pretty much. They know how bad storms get, and they were fearing for their life. You think they were stoked? They were soaked to the bone. But sometimes you've got you to worship wet. Sometimes you've got to come to Christ when you're wet and you're broken down and you don't have any faith and say, Jesus, this is the time that I need you. The greatest medication in healing, the greatest medication in healing is just to wake up or just to walk up in the house of God and raise your hands and just say, you know what? I'm going to praise you in spite of my circumstances. I'm going to praise you in spite of my situation and in spite of myself. I'm just going to praise you with empty hands. Lord, I might be soaked to the bone. I might have little faith. Water might be filling my boat. I might be wet. But you know what? Jesus, I know that you are the resurrected life, the lion and the lamb, my alpha, my omega. I know you. You are faithful. You are going to finish what you've started. Lord, you are my King Jesus and my Savior. The Bible, this is a really key, key important thing I've read in this. It says that they woke Jesus up. I don't mean to turn this into a sermon. I just felt like, man, this is... This is something that I've, I've read into testimonies and stuff. Like, this, this is kind of my testimony because I've thought just because I was saved, you know, it's going to be all good and it's going to be all great. That's, that's, not, that's not the way it is. But we know that Jesus is consistent and faithful in our lives. It said that Jesus said, quiet, peace be still. And the, form, and the storm was quiet. It said, you have no faith. Jesus spoke to the storm as if it was a person. But here's the thing. Jesus spoke to it, and the storm did exactly what its creator commanded it to do. The storms of your life are going to stop and cease because the creator commanded them to. They said, I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. They said, uh, 
Who is this man? See, they were terrified. They had a feeling that they fear exceedingly. That's what it says, they feared exceedingly in some translations. So who is this that the winds and the waves obey him? A storm in your life wants you to be afraid of it. The storm in your life wants your awe. See, at that moment, they were so focused on the storm, but when their attention got corrected on Jesus, they saw that Jesus was their awe. Jesus should have been the focused attention from the beginning. How many times do we do that in our lives and storms come up? In my testimony, I've been focused, so focused on what's happening that I haven't been focused on Jesus. Man, I... The, the storm wants our all. There's only one that is holy and true, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's where our all needs to be focused all the time. The disciples' awe was properly placed once the storm stopped. But we should have we should have placed it in the midst of it. While the storms was at its peak and angry, the disciples, when they went down to look at Jesus and to wake Jesus up, they said, Jesus, don't you care? You see, what's, what's the Bible say? The Bible says that Jesus was sleeping on a cushion. These people, he was sleeping on a pillow. That means our Savior was comfy. He was comfortable in the middle of a storm. Man, when, the, when it was at its peak, but you know what the disciples should have said? I believe this. They, they should have looked at him and said, Man, who, who is this that the wind and the waves do not wake him? They don't wake him. He doesn't fear and tremble at the storms of your life. The storms of your life will do as they are commanded to do. He sleeps through storms. Don't let your storms look like they can outweigh God. They can be bigger than God. Don't let that happen. God is bigger. We should be focusing our awe on him. Lord, we should just we should be totally fixated on him that he is he consumes us day and night. <sighs> Let me tell you something. Storms of your life, when you focus on Jesus, I find myself saying, but I want you all to say this too. Okay? Jesus, you are my savior, you are my friend, you're my deliverer, my comforter. Lord, you are my peace. Lord, you are my all. Lord, I want to give you faith. I want to give you devotion, and I want to give you trust. Man, if I, if I would have thought like that from the beginning, maybe I wouldn't have gone to jail. But I'll tell you one thing is true and for sure, and I'll finish this up with this. When I was in jail, I remember thinking to myself, and I read the passage of Jonah, and I was like, man, how similar is this place to inside of a whale's belly. But you know what? Jesus saved me through jail. I am so glad that I went to jail. I know some of you guys are like, what, what is this guy talking about? I am so glad I went to jail because I know what it's like to be stripped of everything, to have no more possessions. The only thing I took in in jail was the shirts, underwear, and socks that I was wearing when I went to my court date. That was it. Literally stripped of nothing, had no possessions, nothing. I've been down the road to destruction. I've been in that pit in the muck, in the mire. I've been, you know, at the end of my rope. But you know what? Jesus is just, man, he scooped me up, put me back on the rock, and said, get up, repent, and keep on moving. Man, I am so glad that I went to jail because now, here, here's the awesome part. Now, I can look down that road and say, you know what? I know where that road leads. I know what it's like down that road. I know what jail's like. If I would have never gone through that, I would have, I would have looked at my whole life, man, what, what's it like? Like, I don't know what those people are going through, but you know what? I know now. 
I know what those people are going through. Help me. I mean, Jesus totally saved me from myself. My flesh and my bone are weak without Jesus. Man, I'll tell you one thing. My all is now properly placed on the Lord Jesus Christ, my King, my King Jesus, my Savior, my salvation. I, uh, I think what the whole point of this is that if you've been on drugs and in jail, we would like you to work with our teenagers. No, I'm just... No, I, I, I think what God wants us to know is that um, we were created with a purpose, and it doesn't matter what our past looks like and where we came from and all the things that we've been through. Um, God can, he can use you, and he wants to take your testimony to go back to the same people like Missy was talking about, go back to the people that were in the same muck and mire and the stuff that you were in and show them how to get free. I, I wrote on my uh, Facebook, I believe it was last night, that um, if you were somehow able to be free of some chains and you were looking around and saw people stuck in the same chains, wouldn't you want to tell them how to get free? Regardless of what your past is or what you've been involved in, you've got to shed that shame, get rid of that shame because God wants you to free somebody else with your testimony. Don't be ashamed of it. God wants to use it. Um, God wants to use your mistakes and your past and your problems because somebody else needs a hero that's overcome it. Let's bow for prayer and we'll dismiss you. Thank you for your time today. Heavenly Father, thank you for not wasting anything. Not one bad decision. Not one mistake. Not one wrong turn. God, thank you for loving us through all of that. And what an incredible thought that you turn all of those things into good if we love you. God, I pray that there be freedom here today for somebody. I pray that they, your word was spoken about often, Lord. I pray that they would seek it, find it, and find the truth that's in it, and the truth will set them free. Lord, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for the folks that are here. Oh, we praise you because we were fearfully and wonderfully made and you have a plan and it's the best plan because you can do nothing less. In your precious name we pray, so be it. You're dismissed.